Yes, with pleasure. So, dear all, I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of my French colleagues to share vision and experience about uh, social innovation today. I want to thank all the speakers, the participants, to thank also the, the French Ministry of Research and Innovation and the EU Commission for choosing this very modern topic. I am Agnès Soudier, here today as chairwoman of a very young think tank, the Impact Tank, created two years ago and dedicated to social impact. And as an introduction, I would like to share four convictions of the Impact Tank that I think resonate very much with our program today. First, our countries need to move at scale on many social innovations. Unmet needs are everywhere, and there are thousands of solutions on the ground, but too many are sort of proof of concept, we would say today. And moving at scale, at scale is an old challenge in the social area. It is not easy for the quality, the engagement, the patience of people are key for success, but I would say we have no choice. We need to move at scale. But to move at scale, we need academics, I think, to understand, evaluate, improve what is done on the ground. Thanks to evaluation, we will be able to secure stable fundings and often rebuild public policies. But at the reverse, without evaluation, fundings, fundings will remain chaotic. Social area has not been an area easy for researchers because there was not to make it clear, a lot of funding for that. But I think uh, things are changing today and uh, we will be more able to use the power of academics to change social policies. Third conviction, and I would say more important, evaluation is moving and needs to move towards results, towards outcome, thanks to data. There are potentially as many data in social care than in healthcare. And you all know that healthcare is now moving to a value-based healthcare based on data. And we need to have the same move, uh, I think, for, for, for social. And this, this is the future, I think, of social policy and the future of social policies well-funded. Last conviction, innovation in social area will come uh, in general, more often from association, associations and public bodies. But more and more companies are committed to invent new solutions for fragile uh, people, populations, and territories facing difficulties. And it's our duty to join forces with these companies so as to improve uh, the results. Creating the needed links between academics and project owners is at the core of the project of the Impact Tank. And that's why I'm so happy that we have been chosen to animate uh, this, this, the discussion today. And I'm sure it will contribute to this uh, very ambitious objective. Thanks a lot once more for joining. And I leave the floor to Emeline to animate uh, the, the day. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you speakers and audience for joining us today. So I'm Emeline Stevena and will be the moderator of for today's conference. I'm the scientific director of the Impact Tank, a think tank dedicated to the promotion of social innovation. This conference is organized within the framework of the French presidency of the European Union. It aims at giving the voice to researchers from diverse European countries on how to develop, scale up, measure and promote social innovation from education to entrepreneurship and public policies. We will also share concrete examples of action research projects on social innovation. You can see the agenda of the conference on the screen. So the first part will be on research perspective on social innovation in Europe with six key questions. And then we will have examples of action research projects on social innovation. We also share with you some technical rules to make sure this online conference is going well. So there will be a replay of the session. Please turn, on, turn off your micro microphone um, to be sure that uh, it's comfortable for everyone. 
And feel free to ask your questions to the speakers in the chat. And we will have Q&A sessions at the end of each session. And for the speakers, please keep on the time you give it to you uh, for the, the speak you will going to give us with. Give us. So thanks a lot. And without waiting any longer, I will let Jürgen Owen introduce the session. So Jürgen, you are a world-renowned researcher in the field of social innovation. You have coordinated the Social Innovation Drive project and advised European policymakers. You also teach and lead, lead the Social Research Center at TU Dortmund University in Germany and founded the European School of Social Innovation. You have worked on the theory, practices, and ways to promote social innovation. More recently, you have published a book entitled a Research Agenda for Social Innovation. Following on from your work, you will introduce this session by discussing how to develop social innovation at the European level. So please. So, yeah, thank you so much for the uh, introducing me so nicely. I try to, uh, yeah, there you can see my screen, I think. Yes, I change yes. into the presentation mode and uh, yeah, everything can see my screen and uh, listen to my voice. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this really important uh, web conference. I think it's really important uh, to discuss uh, how we can uh, produce a higher impact of social innovation activities. And I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to shed some light uh, on some important development uh, at the European level. And um, I have to apologize in advance that I've if I have any problems with my voice, it's because I've just got over a corona uh, infection. So uh, please, uh, um, I, that's, that's a problem that could appear. But I think I will go through the presentation and uh, as time is very limited, I would like to just uh, jump into my presentation. And uh, if we see uh, the uh, development of social innovation, we see that we have already countless approaches of uh, successful social innovation initiatives that illustrate the strengths and the potential of social innovation to cope with uh, great societal challenges and also to open up new avenues for a sustainable future. Uh, if you take the social business models or micro credit credits that was developed by Mohamed Yunus, car sharing models, uh, where Norbert Kunz play a very important role in Germany to develop these models, but also activities that focus on uh, to make our cities uh, more resilient to climate change are very important examples uh, for social innovation. And uh, we have to say that the European Union was and is an important driver of social innovation policy and research. Already Manuel Barroso uh, 15 years ago said that creativity and innovation in general and uh, social innovation in particular are essential factors for fostering sustainable growth, securing jobs and increasing competitive abilities, especially in the midst of the economic and financial market crisis. And I think we will go through new crises uh, in the next years uh, with regard to uh, the things that happen in the Ukrainian today. But also 10 years ago, uh, later, uh, Carlos Boydas, who is a, was a, a commissioner for research and innovation said that in the European Union, we're going to put more money into social innovation, not because it's trendy, but because we believe that the future of innovation is about social innovation. And these were not just words, but the European Union has supported and promoted research, development and dissemination of social innovation in many programs like the Framework Program, Interact Program, European Social Fund and so on and so on. And so a new generation of European funded project has contributed to a theoretical foundation of social innovation research covering different aspects of the emerging research field. So like the relationship between social innovation and societal transformation, the complexity of innovation and system thinking, the uh, role of uh, social innovation to promote sustainable development, uh, and also to cope with the digital transformation. And also a very important question, I think that Georgi uh, Kulev will go on that uh, to later, is the measuring uh, about social innovation activities. 
So one of the projects uh, that uh, was funded by the European Union was the Asset Drive project in the framework of which we had carried out a global mapping of social innovation initiatives. And we have analyzed 1,005 cases. And uh, what becomes clear that social innovation has become a ubiquitous concept. You find social innovation initiatives all around the world. You find them in Latin America, North America, you find them in Asia, in Australia, New Zealand, and many, many European countries. And uh, it's also true that uh, you find uh, social innovation uh, initiatives in many po policy fields. Uh, providing new solutions for all problems. And I mentioned the very famous uh, social innovation initiatives on my first slide, but there were also a lot of very small social innovation initiatives that are very important to see. And you find more information about these uh, manifold social innovation initiatives in our Atlas of Social Innovation. However, it is also important to say, and uh, I think that Agnes Odia already mentioned that, that many of these social innovation initiatives uh, do not achieve a greater impact. Often they remain limited to the local or regional environment in which they have been developed and without uh, developing strategies for scaling or dissemination beyond the local level. And that is a very important uh, point and uh, problem because uh, if we see the how huge the uh, challenges we are we are facing, we need a stronger impact for social innovation. And that brings me to the second part of my presentation. And that is about how to unleash the potential of social innovation and how to overcome the barriers and uh, that we need to create appropriate uh, infrastructures and framework conditions for social innovation. And I think one of the most important framework condition of social innovation to create an ecosystem for social innovation. The traditional ecosystem you see on the left side of the slide uh, for technology innovation is that government, economy, and academia work together to create technological uh, solutions and then transfer that to society. I think in social innovation is different and the other way around because many of the social innovation, they are created in society by civil society agents like citizens, like social movements like NPOs, like social entrepreneurs and so on. And I think uh, we have to uh, understand how we can support civil society to create these activities. And that is also a very important point for university. And in our as a drive project, we also found out that until now, uh, apart from a few very important uh, exceptions, the universities does not play a very important role in these activities. So today we see universities and research institutes confronted with a challenge to further develop the potential in researching, developing and dissemination social innovation. And that means three things, to integrate the topic of social innovation in class and teaching, to research social innovation and to give an impulse to processes of societal change and to include societal actors at an early stage in research and transfer to increase the potential of innovation for society, uh, for social innovation in society. And uh, to be honest, I think that is much more than just adding a topic to the research agenda of uh, the university. I think we also need new uh, research and teaching concepts that allow to uh, participation of civil society agents in our research and in our, uh, uh, in our teaching, and that science should be an active driver and stakeholder of the processes of society transformation and change. And I think Frank Mula, who is one of the most uh, known uh, researcher in the field of social innovation, will give us uh, some very interesting insights in his experience about the role of action research in social innovation processes, and also design thinking, a new mode of knowledge production or uh, citizen science, they play a very important role in the field of social innovation. The second point is that we also need uh, appropriate infrastructures for social innovation. In Germany, every city, every uh, university has a technology park or a department for the the technology development, but we also need such infrastructures uh, for social innovation. 
And uh, in the uh, last years, uh, um, these centers have emerged in many parts of the world, supported by different institutions. There's only a really a short uh, uh, selected overview uh, about some of these centers, like the Australian Center for Social Innovation in Adelaide in Australia, or the Center for Social Innovation in Toronto. And uh, there are also a lot of centers for social innovation in European countries. And um, they were driven by different actors. Uh, there are centers that are driven by universities, but there are also centers uh, that are driven by social entrepreneurs. Uh, we have uh, wonderful examples that have been developed from Norbert Kunz here in Germany. And we have also uh, centers for social innovation that were driven by the community. And um, they have uh, the uh, important task to provide institutional processes and spaces for experimentation facilitate innovation processes and using a special innovation methods like co-creation methods or the design thinking methods. They have to work on societal challenges and social demands. And uh, it is very important to engage with cross-sectoral multi-stakeholder teams and promote practice inventions as prototypes with high innovation potential. We also need, and uh, that is uh, my last point today, uh, a comprehensive innovation policy, which is also uh, the core idea of the new high tech strategy in Germany. A comprehensive innovation uh, policy means that new participation and collaboration structures, co-creation and user involvement, empowerment and use human uh, resources play a very, uh, very, play a very important uh, part in this uh, innovation strategy. And therefore, we also need new funding formats. Funding formats that uh, uh, allow two things. On the one hand, they should help us to explore the specifics of social innovation. On the other hand, we also have to think about funding formats that merge social and technological way innovations in a synergistic way. And uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation. And I think that the great challenge for contemporary innovation research and policy lies in analyzing the potential of social innovation in the creation of the new social practices that enhance an inclusive, equitable, democratic, participative, and I would say after the experience of the last two weeks, a peaceful society. I think peaceful society is something that we have to focus on within the next years because something that we have taken for granted is not, uh, is not to take for granted, is to fight for. And I think that is a very important future task for social innovation uh, activities. And I think the European twin strategy that has a focus on digital and green technologies need to be aligned with the concept of social innovation. And this only this is the foundation for mission-oriented innovation policy, exploiting the potential of technological and social innovation for the whole society. And to end my presentation with a, I think, quite successful uh, example of these social innovation activities is uh, the city of Dortmund that uh, followed this path and has been awarded as European Capital of Innovation uh, last November, not because it has a good uh, University of Technology and a wonderful uh, technology park, but because it has focused on innovation next door, on the innovation in the neighborhood. And the core idea is that innovation are not based on a single brilliant idea from a genius, uh, also not from a social entrepreneur. <laughs> they come about when people work together on a shared vision for a better future, and that uh, Dortmund tries to be the breeding ground and to involve all stakeholders in this new open communication culture and broad participation processes. Thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, Jürgen Howard, for this overview of uh, the challenges of social innovation, but the potentiality of social innovation in Europe. Uh, we will move on to the next topic of this session dedicated to policymakers and how they can support social innovation and make connections with social, between social innovation and public policies. We'll start with a pre-recorded video of Amélie de Montchalin, the French Minister of Public Transformation, who will present two initiatives from our ministry, the barometer of the results of public action, which shows how the use of public data can measure the change made by every public policy in each territory, and the accelerator of citizens' initiative to support and scale up citizens' uh, movements. 
Dear friends, I'm really delighted to take part in your discussion on social innovation in Europe. The first thing I would like to really emphasize is how much public action needs to be focused on impact and transparency. This is a priority of President Macron since 2017, and this is why I launched in my ministry what we call the barometer of the results of public action. For 43 priority policies in 10 key areas of daily life, like ecological transition, employment, economy, health, family and disability, the barometer lays out what the reality used to be in the country in 2017, what it is today, and what are the objectives we had set up for us to finish our mandate at the end of 2022, and we put in this barometer all the detailed results for all territories of the country. The barometer allows then French citizens, economic and social players, local elected officials, members of the parliament and the government to have the same vision of the objectives that must be reached on the main priorities of public action, of where we are today, of our progresses, and of the remaining collective efforts to be made. The barometer highlights real territorial disparities in certain reforms. It allows us to show that the results are not those of the state of, or of a specific ministry. It shows that everywhere where it works, it is because we have a collective, public, effective action and people really working together from the citizens, the companies, the local officials and the state. This is why I have initiated since the release of the barometer at the early January 2021, a Tour de France, which is a visit I do every Friday in a département, a constituency, where I review the results of the barometer with all the players involved locally to see what works, what could improve, and where we are and where we go. And steering public action by its impact in complete transparency means really putting efficiency right down to the last mile on the ground. It means restoring confidence in politics by not only showing announcements, speeches, laws or plans, but really to bring to each of, of our fellow citizens where it lives real and concrete changes in its daily life. Bottom line, this initiative shows that public action has a real impact. At national level, trends are positive for most public policies, but for users, for citizens, for democratic actors, we need to have a snapshot, really factual, on what public action is changing where they are, in their territory, in their daily life, and this is the way we really think we can increase confidence in the usefulness of voting, of choosing a policy rather than another and showing the impact we have by public action. For political and administrative leaders, it really means putting efficiency to the last mile of the heart of the action. And to my knowledge, this is an unprecedented exercise in transparency in Europe. By definition, we put all the raw data available, accessible to everyone as open data, Several think tanks have already used the data to produce instructive analysis of our public policies. And I think the barometer could in the future inspire other European countries or European institutions to create a similar tool which would demonstrate to citizens how in many areas their daily life has improved thanks to the action of their government or the European Union. Of course, social innovation have a major role to play in solving public policy issues. We had discovered in France a number of initiatives, COVID tracker, Vitmados, COVID list, breaking the chain, and this crisis has made visible and even accelerated the development of ideas and projects of general interest carried out by citizens and NGOs. In fact, civil society is involved in solving many problems by building solutions of general interest. But their development is not always easy. It can be complicated to access useful public data, to knock on the right door in the right ministry, to gain visibility, to be recognized and distributed by the administration. So to answer this issue, President Macron has announced on December 15th that he wanted to set up an accelerator 
of citizen initiative to support and provide the necessary boost to citizens, association companies, and everyone who has a public utility project. This acceleration program that we launched since then aims to encourage the emergence of citizen initiatives of general interest and make them visible. It also aims at bringing together and facilitating access to the resources, support, expertise that governments and ministries can provide. And it also aims at putting in place the necessary conditions and, lever and levers to accelerate the scaling up of projects and their deployment. It also aims at developing collaborations and synergies between civil society and public authorities and bringing together administrations and agents around common projects. With this accelerator, the administration offers its help to projects carried out by citizens of public interest to then accelerate the development and the promotion and the deal is that these initiatives need to be consistent with the values of public service, with the values of transparency, and that they must really contribute to the common good. The project, after being selected by the administration and a citizen jury, is then accelerated for three months, during which a pool of mentors may be called upon to help the project, provide it with the right contacts, open up the right data sets, and we can also support financially such initiatives. And faced with the current and future challenges, such as the COVID-19 pandemic or climate change, or issues with inequalities growing up, we have to welcome outside innovation coming from civil society. The accelerator of civil initiatives is at the heart of this effort to open up our doors to those able to help us being more efficient, more inclusive in, in a way to, be, to build more confidence with citizens that we really aim at building common good. I will announce next Monday the composition of the first class of projects benefiting from our accelerator. I really wish you very good day, very good exchanges, and I thank you very much for giving me the occasion to present what we do in France for transparency and inclusion of civil society in our public action agenda. Thank you. We will now welcome Risto Review. Sorry for the pronunciation of your name. Uh, you are a senior expert at the European Commission's Directorate General for Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. You hold a PhD in Social Sciences from the University of Tampere. And you have also worked in the Directorate General of Education and Culture and in the Committee of the Regions of the European Union. So thank you for being here. Um, my first question will be the, this one. What is the current role of the European Union in identifying and supporting social innovation? You led a program such as the European Social Fund, and it can be a good, good example of that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here on, on behalf of the institution, but also, also personally. So happy to be with you. And um, um, I have a good starting point in that way that uh, the introduction by, by Jürgen previously was wonderful. It presented a big picture. And um, uh, I can join that, that saying that currently social innovation is relatively strongly on the agenda of the EU, and both in terms of policy and in terms of programs. And uh, on the policy side, I would just like to mention one recent event. Uh, commission adopted uh, 9th of December last year an action plan uh, for social economy. And in that action plan for social economy, there was also a dedicated chapter on social innovation. And what is even more important and more interesting than the communication that was adopted uh, in December is the promised follow-up, because one of the actions that Commission is promo uh, promising in, in this action plan is a future Commission proposal for a Council recommendation on uh, social economy. So this means that you, the Council would give advice to member states on how to create enabling conditions for social economy to 
to develop to to flourish and to to meet the expectations and the untapped potential and of course again in that that situation there will be space and place for social innovation uh, there could very well be again a chapter or, or, or part of that recommendation that addresses social innovation, exactly looking at this kind of ecosystem elements that uh, Jürgen was mentioning. So advising, encouraging member states to create uh, enabling conditions for social innovation also to, to develop and emerge in the country. So uh, you stay tuned, it's coming rather soon and there will be opportunities to to, to give brilliant input for that. Now, moving from policy to, to programs, and, and indeed I currently work in the unit that is coordinating the implementation of the uh, design and implementation of the European Social Fund, which is the major funding program of uh, the European Union in the area of human capital, we could say, nearly 100 billion euros uh, implemented there. But um, before going exactly to this, I would say that, uh, as Jürgen mentioned, there are many EU programs that uh, are relevant for social innovation. And, and I would put them into two categories, very much simplified way of <laughs> categorizing the, the situations. But there are many situations where EU programs are addressing social challenges, and without explicitly men mentioning social innovation, they still create opportunities for social innovation. And social innovation emerges within the projects that are funded under these programs. If I can simply mention, for example, when Erasmus is addressing skills issues, there are social innovations that emerge in that context. Or if in the regional development uh, context, there are smart specialization strategies created in regions and cities, uh, social innovation might be on the agenda, or the, the social innovation type of solution might emerge, even if they wouldn't be uh, specifically addressed. And in this respect, I would mention there are two challenges that I, I would like to, to highlight here. One is, a, let's say, participation challenge that um, we need to and this is a challenge for us uh, bureaucrats uh, managing these programs. We, we need to get and keep the requirements for participation so that uh, social innovation relevant stakeholders can participate and find their place in these uh, programs. And, and this fully uh, within the quadruple helix concept that, uh, that uh, the, so the civil society organizations need to be able to participate. But there is an, another participation challenge, another dimension of this challenge is not only getting the requirements right, but then also getting the information to these stakeholders and encourage them to take and make use of the opportunities. There are also many unused opportunities there where the requirements are already right and open, but still uh, may be um, not fully used by uh, the relevant stakeholders. Now, the, the other challenge would be what I would call recognition challenge, because when social innovations emerge in these, uh, under these programs and, and projects, uh, it is a challenge to make them visible and recognize them as social innovation. Some of them remain not recognized as social innovation, and, and this is a, a, a huge challenge also to, to make the social uh, innovation visible. Now, secondly, we also have EU programs that are explicitly addressing social innovation, which are uh, looking at the issue of social innovation specifically and, and boosting that. And Horizon Research Program was already uh, mentioned that there has been research specifically focusing on social innovation. There has been also a social innovation competition that is a kind of visibility and matching and uh, mobilization exercise. There recently was also the European Social Cat Catalyst Fund uh, exercise, which was specifically looking at this scaling up uh, challenge. And actually in the social economy action plan that I mentioned, there is also reference to the future second phase of the um, uh, European Social Catalyst Fund. We don't know the parameters yet, but it's uh, in the pipeline and, and will follow up. 
Now, in my program area, European Social Fund Plus, I can also, I'm happy to tell you that we have a bold approach now within the current programming period to support social innovation in relatively holistic way. And again, they are dividing that into two categories. First, at the le level of member states, because uh, European Social Fund is implemented mainly by the member states, so that each country, they have their own uh, allocations of ESF funds, and they use them uh, uh, so that they are programmed in the member state in cooperation with the Commission, but then implemented by the member state in the country. Now, the new element uh, in the ESF Plus regulation is that every member state is required now to address social innovation explicitly, include a kind of building block in the program, which is dedicated to social innovation. It can include actions that are addressing social issues, and then in that particular case, looking how social innovation can contribute to addressing this social uh, challenging question, but they can also include this kind of ecosystem building measures. So promoting uh, the enabling environment for social innovation, networking, capacity building, finance, and, and so on. Now, in addition to this member state level, we also do something at the European level. We have little money in comparison to what is uh, implemented at member states level, but we still have a, a reasonable resources. And, and we have a new set of measures there, particularly focusing on this scaling and replication challenge. And um, we will have, uh, hopefully, from the second part of this year onwards during this programming period, a new types of calls for proposals, which will particularly uh, focus on scaling and replication of social innovation. And uh, this scaling and replication can start from different starting points, but, but anyway, the the notion is related to the fact that we recognize that there are many social innovation already they're around, how to make them to scale up, how to help member states to make good use of the social innovations that exist. Secondly, we are also, we have in the pipeline what we call social innovation competence center at the EU level, which would be that kind of focal point, which, which would take ownership of this um, promoting social innovation uh, environment and ecosystem at EU level, capacity building, mutual learning, knowledge hub, uh, notably they're creating synergies between um, uh, also with Horizon program and other EU programs which produce knowledge and understanding of social innovation, making that again better available for stakeholders in a user-friendly manner. Um, and of course then in, in, in a bigger manner also communication and awareness raising issues of social innovation, including also uh, communicating to policymakers. Um, and while we are planning that at the EU level, we, have, we are currently already financing similar processes at the level of member states, building national competence centers for social innovation. I have recognized that today there are many colleagues around who are involved in one or the other way in these uh, exercises. And of course, what is what we are building at national level and what will be coming uh, at the EU level, they will need to be complementary so that the European Competence Centre can also benefit from the uh, work what is done at the national level and vice versa, possibly also help the national competence centres in their transnational work. In addition, ESF Plus still includes also continuation of what, what is currently, what, what has happened so far under the call, uh, under the program, which was called EASY, the European um, Employment and Social Innovation Program. There are social experimentation calls there, and there is also support for European level networks that are relevant for social innovation, including, for example, uh, European Venture Philanthropy Association or Euclid Network that works with social enterprise organize, support organizations. So uh, this was a short <laughs> Um, reflection about policies and programs at EU level. Not comprehensive, but I hope uh, it makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very clear and comprehensive. 
the next part of this session focuses on impact assessment. To what extent measuring the impact of social innovation is necessary and how to generalize its practice? To cover this issue, we we'll welcome two researchers familiar with social entrepreneurship and social impact assessment, Lisa Berger and Georgie Kierf. Lisa, you are the director of the SAD Center for Social Impact in Barcelona and visiting scholar at Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. You are involved both in the field of practice and research around social impact. You also work with institutions such as OECD as a scientific member to analyze impact standards. Georgie Kerf, you are a senior researcher on social enterprise and social innovation at the Center for Social Investment of Heidelberg University, and you are teaching at the Business School of Politecnico di Milano on impact investing, sustainable energy, and social economy. You have been working on developing and testing social innovation indicators in European projects, such as the German project in DSI, and have been awarded in the 2021 Research Prize for Social Market Economy for your research on measuring the social added value of organizations in society. Um, no, social impact assessment means measuring the direct or indirect, expected or unexpected, positive or negative effects of an action on its stakeholders. I'm turning to you, Georgie, to ask you the first questions of the discussion. What is the link between social impact assessment and social innovation? Thanks very much, Emeline. Um, I think we've already heard from the previous speakers, from Jürgen, Risto, uh, but also uh, Amelie, that uh, this is really both are basically very hot topics. Everyone is interested in those. Uh, and I think the impact agenda is basically very strongly driven on the organizational level. Let's just think of, uh, you know, Larry Fink and the big sort of investment companies that are talking about creating value for society and impact. So this is really, um, you know, affecting a broad range of organizations, I think. And social innovation is clearly, as Risto was also pointing out, uh, a priority at the uh, at the policy level, especially at the societal level. And so those things are really interconnected because social innovation is really about promoting um, social worthy social outcomes and also enhancing society's cap capacity to act. That's something that we know from very early um, sort of research projects funded by the European Commission, such as TEPC, SIMPAC, some of the work that Jürgen and others have been involved in. Uh, and I think it's very important to actually think about how we can assess these kinds of transformations. Um, and it really is a major challenge to, to actually do that. And, and what we've seen in the statement um, that, that, that was just given, one of the key challenges that we see is that we don't have enough data available to actually assess these kinds of you know, value added and how social innovation is actually promoting societal well-being. And so I, you know, I can only, I already posted it into the chat, I can only applaud these kinds of initiatives because you mentioned the uh, the Indizi project where we're trying to come up with indicators around social innovation. And one of the major sort of um, roadblocks there is data availability. So often you don't really see what kind of resources there are in society, not to even speak of, you know, what kind of transformation social innovation brings to society. So I think that's really a, a huge challenge um, and, and something that we need to tackle actively and where policy can play a, a big role, as we've just heard. Okay, thank you. Lisa, you know well how challenging it is to engage in a strategy of social impact assessment, especially for small organizations. Can you tell us how concretely it works for organization to assess the social and environmental impact of their initiatives? Yes, sure. Thank you so much, Emilien. Um, and thanks for inviting me. And um, of course, this is a, a sort of um, the big question of how to do it. Um, I do think that we have made a lot of progress you know, on, on this topic in the past years. Um, and um, sometimes when I hear from smaller organizations that say, we don't know where to start, you know, we don't have the resources. Um, the, the sort of question I asked them then is, so how do you actually know that you're, um, you know, you're having an impact? How do you know that you're making some sort of a change on your target population if you're not measuring that? Uh, so I guess a, a sort of a first recommendation is really to set aside some resources to this, to really invest in that. So that might mean, you know, having a person who's responsible, if it's a small organization that might be, you know, part-time of a person 
but I definitely do not recommend um, sort of outsourcing this to some ex external consultants who are doing all the job for you and then you don't really know how to do it yourself. Um, so it's, it's something, so the first step is really to kind of make a decision that this is something that is important um, and actually invest in that. Um, and then the other thing is really uh, to understand what are your objectives? So what is it that you're trying to achieve? Um, as a, a social organization, so what is the, the social change that you, you're trying to achieve? Um, and then um, trying to quantify that. Say, um, you know, during a certain time period, this is, this is the change that I, I would like to achieve. Uh, what are the key metrics uh, that I'm going to use to actually um, have a better understanding of this? So to, to set certain indicators and certain objectives that you want to achieve during the time period. And then obviously uh, it's also very important to uh, connect with your key stakeholders. So understand who, um, who are your concrete beneficiaries um, and the stakeholders that are, will, will be affected by your activities and engage with them, understand if this is actually happening, are these uh, metrics important as well to them? Um, and then try to understand how you can get data uh, in the best way. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very kind of um, brief introduction into impact measurement, but I, I also wanted to say that um, it's important not to just sort of jump to indicators and start measuring without really understanding what you're trying to achieve. Um, because in the end, you don't want it to be just another level of bureaucracy, a burden for uh, these social organizations, you want it to be actionable. You want the data to be something that they can use in their decision making. Uh, so you want to also understand how you can integrate that data into the way you work, your management management systems as an organization. Um, so that is really then about, um, you know, how do you actually use the data? And I think, you know, some of the examples that we've heard previous in, uh, you know, in this uh, conference have been interesting as well when it comes to how do you use data for policy? So how can you make policy more data-driven? And it comes back to the same sort of principle of, you know, you should be collecting the data that you, um, that you need to understand if you're solving the problem. Um, and if you're, and the data should then tell you, well, actually I'm solving the problem pretty well. I'm not solving the problem at all. You know, there are different de degrees to that. And that, will, that data will then help you rectify your strategy and go back and see how can I do things differently? How can I do things better? Um, so that is really sort of the, the, the recommendation, the overarching recommendation, try to make sure that you're also including the data into your decisions that you're making as an organization, uh, because otherwise, you know, it's just uh, a nice report that you're, um, that you're delivering to, to some stakeholders that might be interested in that, but it's not really making a change for the, the people that you, you want to make a change in their lives. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> um, but let's speak about indicators because we need indicators to measure impact. And Georgie, uh, you work on this topic and what kind of indicators can be accurate to assess the impacts of social innovation? Yeah, as I already alluded to, I think that's really a big challenge. I mean, Lisa was already explaining this and all of the complexities that are involved in, you know, assessing impact, even at the organizational level. And now we're talking about social innovation, something that affects society. So that's really sort of a, a big chunk to, to actually address, right? So I think what we have good research on, good insights on is what makes uh, organizations socially innovative, for instance, really assessing that kind of potential for organizations to push social inno innovation. We have quite good grasp over that and also the process of social innovation once we've identified one really tracking how it came about and what kind of transformations it was pushing uh, we did that for instance in the it's so in project um, that was that is something i think that we have a good command over but it's much more challenging to really come up with an indicator system so as you mentioned in this indizi project and, and actually in a follow-up which is called indizi plus but we're trying to push this work even further. We're trying to come up with an, with an indicator um, system. And what's important there is really to um, assess different levels uh, at which you measure um, social innovation and the capacity to produce social innovation. So what we're looking at is basically that we look at organizations and how they are driving the process. We're also looking at regions. We're looking at citizens, something that Amelie was mentioning in terms of, you know, how trusting are the citizens, how proactive are they, how 
much are they engaged in sort of some kind of civil society action? How much do they see self-responsibility for addressing certain challenges in society? So those are some of the, the, the things that we're trying to capture in there. And the third aspect that we're looking at is that we're trying to sort of dive into um, uh, data on social media in order to see what kind of discourses are going on, what kind of problems are people seeing, what kind of collisions are being built around certain issues in order to really see you know, where is the sort of where, where are early indicators of where social innovation might might happen. Um, and the interesting thing is actually that the OECD is moving into a very similar direction. Um, some of you might have seen this um, ecosystems for social innovation report that they uh, recently launched and that is really a sort of building or even even pushing this work further around uh, indicator systems but i really need to admit that it's still a huge challenge also in relation to the fact that you know we have really big difficulties in having the data availability and doing the kinds of analysis um, that would be necessary in order to find out you know what are the most important factors that come in here and how can we really assess the big transformations but those are i think some very important anchor points having this multi-level perspective and looking at it from from different uh, sides and also not you know forgetting about regions uh, sort of country contexts and especially citizens as sort of a breeding ground as, as emily was also saying um, of social innovation so i think those are very important pieces that are falling into place, uh, but there's still a lot of work to, to really harness um, the insights that might you know, um, come from those. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lisa, um, there is a long debate about standardization. Can we and should we standardize uh, social impact measurement indicators and data? <laughs> uh, yeah, this, this is always the big, one of the big questions. Um, you know, I, I do think that we have moved quite a lot on, on, you know, in terms of standardization of indicators, you know, in, in the past years. Um, so there are these kind of um, standardized libraries of indicators that, that we're using very specific to the field we're in. Uh, so in impact investing, you know, there are certain indicators, you know, the IRIS indicators. Uh, everyone is, is referring to the sustainable development goals, um, which is quite interesting because um, then you, act, you actually ask the organizations, like, how are you measuring against those? Um, and you realize that it, it tends to be more aspirational, you know, that those are kind of the goals that I'm moving towards more generally, sort of looking at, for example, gender equality. Um, but it's very difficult to actually mm, put that at the organizational level. So I think it's kind of touching upon some of the things that uh, Georgi was mentioning before that, you know, what is it that you measure at organization level? What is it that you measure at regional or macro level? So the, the, the sustainable development goals tend to be quite macro, um, focusing more on what, what happens at, at the you know, country or even you know, world level. Uh, which makes it quite difficult for, for uh, you know, an individual organization to actually work towards those specific indicators that are defined. Um, so I think, uh, you know, in general, the indicators need to be, um, you know, very specific to the organization that is using them so that they can be actionable and used in, in management systems. But perhaps as well, you know, as, as you know, if, if you want to uh, promote collaboration between organizations and actually working towards these kind of bigger issues, um, we probably need to rethink a little bit those indicators and, and you know, how do we actually uh, as well ho hold ourselves accountable towards, um, you know, certain of those, those big uh, problems. Um, because if you just work at organizational level and you have those indicators that you measure, um, you might all also fall into certain traps, you know, such as uh, working short term, um, you know, working in silos, not collaborating, um, et cetera. So I, you know, I think that in terms of standardization, we need to keep, keep those things in mind, you know, that we, we don't um, overdo it, you know, on, on the standardization part. Thanks a lot. Um, so, Georgie, what is your point? your view on this topic yeah I, I agree with lisa that there i mean we're still too far away from really going going for standardization right everyone is doing their own little thing sometimes you're coming up with new kinds of uh, ways of assessing 
impact. So I think actually to some degree, although we have a lot of uh, databases of indicators and so on, I think we sometimes lack a theory of how this 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 actually works and, and really have a joint idea of, of, of how you do that. There are some professional societies like the Capitals Coalition that are pushing you know, towards assessing social capital and, and these kinds of things, which I think might actually be some sort of a game changer in, in really conceptualizing this in a in a broader way, but yeah, totally. I mean, um, you still need this tailor making to some degree in order to make this useful for organizations. One thing that I'm always asking myself, and I'm picking up a, a point that Francesca made in the um, in the chat, is why don't we think about this at more of a meta level in terms of you know why don't we think about certain types of interventions instead of individual organizations? Mm. Why doesn't policy push for assessing those right so if we're just thinking about you know community oriented models of living aren't those superior to you know service oriented ones or you know ones that are very individualized and why don't we come up with larger model studies kind of studies where we're really trying to probe what kind of value are those promoting what kind of transformations do we th see through those and and really uh, bringing that in quite early on in the process, right? Not, you know, waiting for the innovation to happen or waiting for a sort of the, whatever it is, the service or the, the, the kind of action principle to materialize and then thinking about, well, what's the impact of it? But really starting very early on in the process of uh, anticipating that um, there was also someone mentioning, you know, this ex ante um, um, mm -hmm. perspective, really thinking about this from the very start and then following up on it. And in a, in a, in a much larger uh, way would actually, I think, push us towards uh, understanding this at a broader level and would enable standardization. Because if we leave it at sort of this uh, organizational level, it will take a very long time to actually do this. Um, and, and I think there's a good reason for policymakers. Uh, and, and I totally agree that, you know, this idea of, you know, asking citizens and so on could be transferred uh, almost one-on-one -on -one, uh, to, to some kind of social innovation projects, uh, even sort of incubator programs and so Okay, so last question uh, for Lisa. Um, what is the role of the European Union or uh, international um, organizations on this topic of social impact measurement? Oh, this is a, a question that um, I have Risto here on, on at the conference, so um, maybe he should be answering that question. But I think, in, you know, in general, um, you know, more sort of in terms of standards and, and regulation and so forth. Um, there, there are different bodies you know, who have um, developed standards on impact measurement in recent years. Um, and I would say that um, you know, as well at, at the European uh, level, of, of course, you have uh, you know, the different measures that, that uh, Risto already alluded to. So I, I'm not going to you know, take on a, a policymaker hat here and explain that. Uh, but I'd rather say perhaps, you know, how are um, the different stakeholders uh, taking, up, taking, um, taking up, you know, those different standards and regulations? And I think, um, I mean, in general, what I've seen in terms of impact measurement, um, it, you know, there's a certain resistance in terms of, of um, you know, different stakeholder groups actually doing it um, when they're, unless they're forced, you know, so um, there's, there's a kind of, uh, incentive like should, um, for example if you think about investors um, they will do it and they will report on it when there's an obligation so now there's the sustainable finance discla disclosure regulation that is forcing in a way um, you know finance actors to report on on sustainability uh, so they're doing that but I'm not sure if they would have done it otherwise um, and uh, you know, in terms of the social sector, there's much more of a tradition of, of, of actually measuring impact um, that you know, the, uh, the finance sector could actually learn from. Um, and in terms of sort of different standards, now the, the uh, UNDP came up with their, the SDG impact standards that are being rolled out. And there's also, also sort of training associated with that and so forth. Um, in, in the finance sector, there's the IFC operating principles that are explaining how do you integrate impact into the investment process. And, and that is also being uh, sort of taken up quite well by the, the finance sector. And um, also because there's this element of disclosure and external verification. So they sort of feel that they need to do it because others are doing it. There's a, so there's a kind of a peer pressure and also this external verification. And I think that's quite helpful. Um, so I'm, you know, I think that 
probably like to, to make this a little bit more, um, uh, you know, something that is Im implemented more widely, um, you know, for social sector organizations, they need to have the, the resources to do it. Um, so there's there needs to be sort of more financing as well for capacity building, um, you know, for organizations to, to focus on that. And for the finance, um, I mean, there's there's a bit like the carrot and the stick, you know, so you need to be in a way obliged to do it, but also, you know, potentially there should be some benefit uh, for them. So that's a little bit um, how I see what's what's going on currently. Thank you so much. Thank you for this exchange. It's a fascinating topic and I wish we had more time to discuss. Um, but we have just discovered the, covered the issue of social impact assessment. Um, now, um, I would like to explore the link between learning and practice. We have the pleasure to welcome uh, Carmen Baunescu on how to promote social innovation on the field from higher education to entrepreneurship. Carmen, you are a professor of business and innovation at the Bucharest Academy of Economic Studies in Romania. Your research focuses on fostering social innovation in higher education in collaboration with local communities and entrepreneurs. You are the chair of the European Cooperation in Science and Technology Cost Action Group, a working group, higher education institutions, so that social change and transformation. And you edited recently a book entitled Social Innovation in Higher Education, Landscape, Practices, and Future Opportunities. So Carmen, how can higher education institutions foster social innovation? How do you prepare your students to answer societal and environmental challenges? Uh, thank you very much, Emeline, for this uh, very nice introduction. First of all, I would like to congratulate you on organizing this very inspiring event. And uh, yes, thank you very much once again for inviting me to be here with you. Uh, if possible, I would like to share my camera to summarize some of my main ideas to answer uh, this uh, question. Uh, of course, um, uh, many of these uh, ideas have been already shared by previous speakers. And um, I'll try to only to um, uh, complement this uh, discussion with uh, some uh, ideas I think we should consider uh, with priority or more carefully uh, in our institutions. Uh, I'd like to stress from the very beginning the need from, um, for higher education institutions to foster social innovation. And uh, uh, for this discussion, I uh, uh, preferred to give priority to these uh, uh, three directions, three dimensions. Uh, on one hand, uh, of course, uh, previous speakers, particularly Professor Powalt, already mentioned about uh, this uh, social innovation ecosystem, Quintapol Helix. Uh, universities are part of this uh, uh, ecosystem, and the social innovation in higher education institutions um, uh, are building uh, this, uh, are extending these partnerships with actors from all those sectors. Either we talk about um, policy level, government, economy level, private companies, civil society, NGOs, environment, of course, and um, uh, academia. Uh, having these uh, connected governance structures uh, give our students uh, the opportunity to practice, to develop and practice and continue improving the skills. So they are able to test actually the skills they are developing by addressing directly uh, different problems raised through these uh, partnerships extended to different actors and contributing to a resolution of those problems with innovative ideas. So this way, our students under the coordination of our educators not only practice their skills in a safe environment, secured environment, uh, but they also can contribute and they uh, uh, contribute to uh, problem resolution with innovative ideas and they um, uh, develop their entrepreneurial schemes, skills and why not become tomorrow's entrepreneurs. Uh, the second dimension I would like to emphasize here is the need to internalize in our institutions these new forms of education like blended learning, teaching through enterprise-based projects, uh, uh, real work with uh, local employers, uh, but also different uh, experiential learning settings. So these are only a few examples. So uh, we have, there is this need to um, not only consider these new forms, uh, alternative forms of uh, education, but also uh, transform them as um, uh, formal practices in our higher education institutions, 
uh, in order to help the students engage with uh, organizations and uh, do this uh, real work, which contributes to resolution of the challenges uh, raised by our uh, partners from all those um, uh, areas. And uh, the third dimension I'd like to emphasize here is that this one, which refers to um, uh, developing a culture of volunteering and uh, of course why not a value creation culture so we'd like our uh, students uh, to um, you know while working on these different uh, societal challenges uh, raised by uh, either private companies or local professional associations uh, local um, communities uh, different uh, uh, groups of um, uh, people local communities um, with uh, different uh, challenges, uh, societal challenges uh, experiencing. Uh, this uh, uh, work on these um, uh, challenges uh, inspire our students to reflect on um, what kind of uh, value they want to create to remove that problem and also contribute to um, developing sustainable uh, solutions on that local market. Uh, this way they are not only improve their awareness level, but they can they become sensitive to these societal challenges and we inspire them to contribute more with their ideas and create value and of course later have an impact by connecting with these professional associations um, um, experiencing having uh, uh, we're raising for us, for our higher education institutions, their societal challenges. I would also like to, um, to refer to different ways we, um, different uh, organizational settings we use in the higher education institutions to uh, help our students collaborate with uh, these um, local partners, with these uh, local communities. Uh, once again, some ideas have been already uh, shared, uh, stressed by my previous, uh, our previous speakers. But uh, yes, these are also ideas I, uh, I uh, would like to share with you here uh, regarding the ways the students can collaborate with these uh, local communities and of course, uh, uh, resolve different uh, problems, societal problems and create impact, create value and impact. Uh, one of these um, uh, settings I would like to uh, share with you here is this one uh, referring to different research acceleration services. Uh, a research um, accelerator uh, can have a different, uh, can take different shapes in our institutions. It could be either only a collaborative network or a an, an, um, formal office in our institutions or only a program or why not a funding program or different prices. And uh, they're meant to bridge the gap between uh, academic business and society, to connect our academic partners with um, business communities that actively invest, invest in uh, education, inventory, networking. In other words, we try to translate the research activities and results produced by um, our um, academics and the researchers into meaningful outcomes and development suggestions for industry, for businesses, for communities, for society at large. Uh, not only we, 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 uh, we aim to translate our research results into meaningful outcomes for our uh, community partners, but uh, also we can uh, 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 ask them to quickly deliver us feedback on the problems, um, um, uh, on our research results, but also on the problems which urgently need resol resolution solving from um, um, us. So it is a uh, um, uh, bi-directional uh, uh, feedback and exchange, learning exchange, uh, which happens for this, um, uh, for this, um, uh, research acceleration services. Another setting uh, I'd like to refer to here is uh, this one, Community Innovation Labs, or um, as previous speak speakers um, called them, uh, Social Innovation Lab, or a Living Lab. Uh, again, these are real world settings uh, created in our organizations, in our institutions, 
uh, experimental spaces, which can uh, be either online, on-site or hybrid, of uh, transdisciplinary or multidisciplinary learning. Uh, in this uh, experimental spaces, we aim at um, facilitating collaboration and the generation of knowledge uh, through a cooperation process through this collective intelligence and uh, drive community change. So we look at uh, the university as a, a main actor, as a key actor in uh, designing local community agenda and by involving um, both academic, but also non-academic uh, stakeholders. And uh, the third um, setting I'd like to refer here is uh, of course, um, uh, different. there are different uh, discipline-based projects uh, done for different uh, uh, knowledge domains uh, with multiple sectors of activity and involving uh, multiple actors, both academic and non-academic um, uh, actors. And uh, again, these are uh, maybe current practices are our institutions are uh, implementing to ensure that um, students engage with organizations uh, and uh, contribute to problem solving with innovative ideas and the creation of impact. Back to you, Emily. Thank you, sorry, Karen. Thank you, thank you for this example. Uh, it's very really inspiring what you're doing with your university. And now we'll have Thierry Sibiud, is the co-founder of the Entrepreneurship and Impact Innovation Share. Uh, I believe his speech will resonate with uh, Carmen's pre previous contribution. Uh, Thierry worked with students, uh, social entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurs, to foster social innovation and assess social impact. Um, according to you, um, how can we promote social innovation from university years? And in your case at the ESEC Business School, how do you prepare students to become tomorrow's social entrepreneurs? Uh, thank you, Emily, for your invitation. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and thank you for other speakers because they already gave a lot of uh, very inspiring and interesting um, uh, uh, ideas about uh, the, the, your question. And I'll do my best to help you and I'll take uh, just eight or 10 minutes because I can check the, the, the clock and I know how difficult it is to moderate such a, such a panel. Um, I, I would say that I quite agree with what uh, Carmen said because uh, I would say that, that we did and that we we are and that we are doing at the moment at ESEC, we founded the chair uh, 20 years ago. That was a, a, a social innovation uh, um, and a real innovation. Um, at that time, not a lot of people in business schools were talking about social innovation. And we decided to develop um, these activities uh, exactly as you said, Carmen, uh, in other words, in an inter interdisciplinary uh, approach uh, and a very practical approach. Because when you teach entrepreneurship and when you teach social entrepreneurship, you just have to be pretty much uh, anchored uh, in the field. You have to be in practice. And that is um, an issue for uh, universities. Because at university, as you know, when you are doing good research, you just think, you just uh, work on data and uh, you are doing some interviews, but the, uh, the, 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 the results, I, I would say the, 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 the practical consequences of what you are doing is not your um, priority. Um, but when you are involved in social um, issues in social enterprise, you, you just have to deal with the practical consequences. And, and, and you, know, you, you know that the time of research is not the time of the, 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 the concrete activities. It takes four, five, sometimes six years to get a publication uh, in, a, in, a, in the top uh, reviews. Uh, and you know, after five years, the reality has changed. So that's why we decided to be very much um, anchored in the, in, the, in, the in the practice, in the field. Um, and and uh, we also helped, somebody in the chat said that in, in, um, in health, for example, universities give some uh, frameworks, some references. 
Um, I think it, one of the difficulty for social is social is everywhere, and social uh, everybody has an idea about social. When you are talking about health, you just have to talk to experts, to technical people, because you know th there is um, um, a scientific background that not everybody has. In social, there is no um, scientific background. It's just the day-to-day -day life. So it's a source of complication to define um, the, 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 the indicators, for example, because everybody is tempted to have its own set of indicators. So we try at, at school and during the courses to give some tools to the students to um, help them, first of all, to become social entrepreneurs or to develop social innovations because you can develop social innovations without being social entrepreneurs. But we help to, we, we try to help them to be sure about uh, some um, uh, uh, about their objectives. Uh, Lisa, you said, you, you talked about the importance of the objectives and see it's very important. So we define the objectives with them. We give them some tools and we insist about the fact that first of all, tools are just tools. And the, the main issue is what you do with tools. And second, how you walk the talks, how you align your um, what you are saying with what you are doing, which is a quite difficult uh, exercise. To do that, we uh, develop some courses. And uh, Jürgen, you said that it's, uh, you know, to develop social innovation in, at university is more than to put a, 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 a small lay of, of social innovation courses. It's really a change uh, of mind because it's very multidisciplinary. You cannot be a, an expert of everything. It's very difficult. And the, 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 the academic culture, encourage people to be very speci specialized in a narrow thing. And social innovation is by essential, by, de by definition, is a broad thing. So we have to find this, uh, I would say this balance, this equilibrium between this uh, necessity of um, scientific rigor, scientific uh, approach, and this necessity to, to, to get the, the global situation. Um, so we, 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 we developed these courses exactly with what you said, Carmen, with blended, with, uh, we developed a lot of MOOCs, for example. All of them are in French, or most of them are in French, so most of you are not interested or with that, but you can go to Coursera and see that we really made a big effort about that. We developed a laboratory about a social impact uh, assessment uh, just to uh, prove to the students that it is necessary to first of all define uh, objectives and then to have the assessment culture uh, in mind uh, at the beginning. That's what I would I, I would say to help to answer your question, Emeline. And once again, thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, just a last question for you, Thierry. Yeah. Uh, you manage the Social Impact Assessment Lab at the SL Business School. What are the goals of this lab? Because you are collecting data, you are doing things on social impact assessment. Yes, yeah, thank you for the question, Emeline. Um, um, we, we, we decided to create the laboratory because we had um, an experience about social assessment. Why? Because since we're we creating, we created um, the social um, uh, incubator uh, in 2008, 12 years ago. That was the first one in France. And when you uh, support uh, social entrepreneurs, of course, you are talking about impact because a social entrepreneur has impact in his core business. That's the hurt of his activity. So we had a culture and we worked with Evelyn, with Emlyn about that. I'm pleased to, um, to mention that Emlyn is one of the best experts uh, about social impact assessment in France. Um, so we, we, we knew about this necessity. We had some first ideas. And in, in four years ago, we realized that more and more people was talking about social innovation um, and, um, the Risto, the, 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 the director of, uh, of uh, Risto, yes, you said that you have social innovation in social economy without talking about social innovation, and you have social innovation in, uh, that you talk about. So that's, uh, it's great because social innovation is everywhere, but it's very difficult to assess that because 
Um, so we, we, we realized that a lot of companies, a lot of organizations were um, concerned with this issue of social value. Uh, and if they talked about social value, they had to measure the social value. So the goal is to give some tools to everybody to create some common language. We, we, wish, we wish that um, Amélie Monchalin would decide to ask business schools, uh, for example, us, or but maybe others, to, to define the, the framework, and then everybody will uh, play with this framework. We do that with different foundations. We are doing that for uh, elderly people with a my lack of humanities. We're doing that for uh, uh, mobility with uh, massive foundation, but it's still a private approach. And uh, we have a legitimacy as a, as a as university, but not, not large enough. So our goal is to contribute, to define um, structure and standardize a set of indicators because that's the condition sine qua non I'm sure everybody understands because sine qua non Latin is universal. Um, sine qua non to get a real social impact assessment, environmental and social impact assessment, which will be useful and which will be the reality because it's very of very easy to talk in. Uh, and right now everybody is talking. I know in, uh, every business school is talking about the fantastic approach of social uh, uh, company. And, and, and then we are in the phase at ESSEC, and I guess, uh, Carmen, you have in the same play, position or Jürgen in your university to prove that we are doing, and we have a major issue on how to teach commitment, how, to, how are the engagement in the, in the society, how to develop this approach. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry. You you've made my conclusion. So we uh, save oh, time. No, no, we save we save time. <laughs> I did it on purpose. I know you were doing this very well. Um, so thank you, thank you so much uh, to uh, to you. And so we've got a question and answers session. Uh, maybe uh, if you want to react to what your colleagues have said, do not hesitate. Uh, Risto or Nuna. Uh, uh, if you want to speak again, please, the floor is yours. Um, do not hesitate to raise your hand if you want to speak again. Okay. Um, we had a few questions in the chat. Uh, one question what, um, about social impact bonds. Uh, do, some of you, do some of you have uh, some feedback on social impact bonds? These two? Uh, you mic microphone yes so, sorry I, I didn't want to come to the issue of social impact bonds but i, I raised my hand for something else lisa okay. namely <laughs> lisa mentioned that she wanted to to move the ball back to me uh, at the question of what eu can do in relation to social impact measurement and actually i don't answer to that question neither but i will explain something that is related to this and um so it, one of the actions that we have under the so European Social Fund is what we call transnational cooperation between the um, managing authorities and also relevant stakeholders. So one of those we call communities of practice and one community of practice is currently working on social innovation issues. We have there about 100 participants and they, they really include relatively uh, wide range of stakeholders. And one, one of the work streams and, and kind of products that is currently in the pipeline is a guide for um, mainly for managing authorities. So those national authorities who manage the ESF uh, implementation in the countries, guide on scaling up social innovation. And of course, in this context then the the question of evidence comes uh, very very strongly into the picture and and there are actually three reflections on that and one is first that that we, we really want also to encourage uh, this kind of use of esf that esf funding can be used to generate evidence so you might have a social problem an issue that you have identified and you launch a series of projects which aim is to generate evidence that what works actually in relation to this uh, social issue. Now, now then the question comes that 
it's very rarely that one or another single project would provide a solution. Rather, you need then uh, thorough work on consolidating, analyzing, understanding that what from the from the certain number of projects, what what comes out from them. George is, spoke about this kind of conceptual approach that that uh, and and this is what we would like to see happening that there would be a conceptualization in that way that you identify the key elements that are actually decisive uh, and and constitute the social innovation that might then work and can be replicated it is not quite often the case that you can replicate a single project in a successful way in another place but when you have created a concept that is solid and mature, then you can uh, you can repeat that in an adapted way in the right circumstances. If I, for example, refer to the concept of housing first, which is very well known currently, uh, there is a lot of evidence behind, a lot of experimentations behind, but I think the concept is currently solid in that way that you, you can adapt and implement it in one or the other country and sticking to the key constitutive elements of the concept. Now, another issue then uh, here is a challenge of communication and advocacy, because of course, it, it doesn't always happen in that way that there is an identified social uh, problem and there is a, this kind of clear demand from, let's say, policy making, policy makers. But there's also, of course, the case that social innovation sometimes go ahead and uh, even identifies new social um, uh, challenges and, and, and surely challenges the current way of doing. And then it's question of advocacy in terms of communicating uh, that in the right way to policymakers so that uh, they see the challenge, uh, the, the, ad, um, the value of the alternative um, proposal. And there, I have traditionally said that we need figures, data, and we need stories. And so the evidence can have different natures and, and combination of this different type of uh, evidence is really the challenge to find. And there again, it might, it, it is most likely a um, cooperation between different kind of stakeholders, including academia, including also the civil society organizers, the activists who are working on and, and so on. So these points related to social impact measurement, but not about measurement, but about the evidence uh, in the picture of uh, uh, using also the, the ESF uh, funds. Thank you. Lisa, you raise your hand. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I, I wanted to, uh, so thanks, Rista, for coming back to my sort of, when I, I pass the ball back to you. Um, but I, I wanted to mention something about social impact bonds since this was a question asked. Um, I mean, I haven't studied in detail the, the, the French ones that, that have been developed. <laughs> I'm sure, Emeline, you will have more information about that. Yes, of course. Um, but I, I just wanted to, to maybe, um, you know, I offer some reflections about social impact bonds uh, in general, um, which I find, you know, could be quite interesting also from a research and policy perspective. Um, so, I mean, for people who don't know about social impact bonds, it's kind of the, um, you know, one of those tools that in impact investing, it's, it's sort of everyone loves them because it's about sort of combining uh, impact measurement with the financial return and uh, so that the investors get a, a financial return if the impact is achieved, uh, etc. And, 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 you know, so that's why it's been sort of promoted in impact investing, but there's a lot of criticism as well, like, is it really working, etc. And, and I think there's conflicting evidence on that. Um, but I, what I, what I find is interesting, and, and this is based on also research project that I'm doing um, on a social impact bonds with a PhD student. Uh, we've been interviewing different um, organizers of social impact bonds. So for example, uh, the ones that have been uh, you know, attempted in, in Spain, there's one in Barcelona on children in care. Um, and what I found was interesting there was that uh, the sort of putting together this vehicle that is trying to solve the problem of uh, you know, what happens with children in care who end up in foster homes, et cetera, that then have lots of problems in terms of, um, you know, dropping out of school, not finding a job, uh, ending up in 
you know, a sort of a spiral of, of negative uh, things happening to them. And, and you can actually break that cycle, uh, you know, if you have an intervention at a certain point in time, that's kind of the theory. Um, but, you know, what is neat about it is that it allowed sort of the, uh, the local government to put together different departments um, who were dealing with children in care, uh, who, who previously were not speaking to each other, you know, so people who are um, thinking about, so the education department with the social services, uh, you know, healthcare, et cetera, coming together and actually looking at the problem of, you know, these particular kids. Um, so, you know, that, that, that is something that I think is quite positive about, you know, sometimes these vehicles that it allows sort of different actors to come together that perhaps were not speaking to each other before and as well uh, enabling public um, private uh, partnerships so that uh, sort of there's a cross-sector collaboration that is enabled. And then the other thing was also that the, the local government was saying that you know, because they were putting this together, they were looking at data in a different way and they were looking at it long, more long-term and how can you actually use this data to develop better policies? So although the social impact bond was finally not even launched or maybe it will be, but it actually helped, um, you know, the, the uh, policymakers think about these issues in a very different and more transversal way. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Jürgen? Yes, I would uh, like to, to address two uh, questions from the chat, uh, which I think is very important for our discussion. The one question was, uh, what is the relationship between social innovation and technological innovation? I think that is a very important point, even if you think about the impact of social innovation. And I think there are two uh, things that we have to see. On the one hand, technologies enable us to develop new social practices and social innovation. As we've seen, for example, in the corona crisis, we are able to use Zoom and other technologies to interact and to make conferences and to do our teaching. And that is something that is very important. Also, before the corona crisis, we had Wikipedia, which allow us to find new ways of collaboration and new ways to, to produce our knowledge and share our knowledge. And that is very important. But also in Latin America, they are very important interesting uh, technology developments uh, there have been developed apps uh, to uh, to to fight against poverty and so on and so on that is one thing and uh, i would like to uh, say that it's not only about high tech it could be very easy uh, and uh, and and only frugal technologies that may help us to produce those new social innovations on the other hand i would say the new technology also require social innovation because if we would really like to uh, use technologies for the benefit of our society we have to develop uh, practices that help us that these technologies do not uh, become something that is bad for society. Uh, for example, you can use technologies in the field of uh, the future of work to replace people or to integrate people in uh, working conditions. Only one example. The second uh, question, very briefly, that was a question uh, what I was, what, what I thought was very interesting about uh, nudge policies. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, nudge policies that try to uh, influence our behavior, I think it's very superficial way because I think our behavior is much complex and rooted in our societal uh, uh, living that we need a, a deeper understanding of how we change our behavior. Therefore, we use the concept of social practices, which also that means that we have some mindsets that we have uh, also technologies and infrastructures that are necessary to see if we really would like to have a deep transition of our behavior. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you. Some, someone else wants to speak? This time is running out. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, we cannot answer all the questions that have been asked in the chat. We will send them to the speakers at the end of the conference and we'll uh, go back to you with the answers afterwards. Thanks a lot. Um, so now um, we'll move on uh, to the next session with uh, Frank Moulet. We are going to speak about action research on social innovations, how concretely researchers can work with people on the field on social innovation. Um, Frank, welcome. You are a professor of spatial planning at the Faculty of Engineering at KU Leuven in Belgium. You did research on macroeconomics and regional development, and in the late 80s, turned to action research on social innovation and local development. 
you took part in uh, and coordinated seven European research projects on topics of social innovation and social measurement, and you published several books like the International Handbook on Social Innovation. Um, you hold a long interest for action research approach around social innovation, and you have contributed for many years now to its development in European Union and the world. You, I leave you now to introduce this second session, please, Frank. I'm not allowed to share my screen. <laughs> It, it should work now. Okay, let me try. Let me try. Now it it's works. Perfect. Yeah, you can see. It. You were not allowed to see the last slide already, but still, I mean, it doesn't matter too much. Hello, everybody. I mean, the, this big disadvantage of these Zoom conferences, of course, is that we miss the coffee break and, and the cookies that come with it. But uh, à la guerre comme à la guerre. Um, I will uh, walk you through these slides, if you, if you like, uh, and I will try not to give too many details on, on the site. Um, I want to stress the emancipatory power of socially innovative action research. Um, in my last slide, I want to explain that there are many different dimensions to that emancipatory power. But first, let me take you for this walk. I mean, there is the question, of course, what is action research? Uh, it would be very nice if in the next few years, a few PhDs would be written on the history of action research because it's all over, it's all over the world, different traditions, different inspirations and, and so on. Then I want to move on to what we did in what I call the Social Innovation Action Research Network, which uh, was uh, launched at the end of the 80s in the context of the Poverty Tree Program. <laughs> It's not a very institutionalized network. Uh, we work a little bit ad hoc. I mean, there are many anarchists, anarchist thinkers are part of the network, which means that we, we explore opportunities and we try to work as much as we can, bottom up and uh, in a communitarian way. Uh, so we don't have to lose uh, time with transaction costs and setting up uh, complicated platforms. Next focus will be on what uh, we understand by socially innovative action research. Uh, what do we do in it? Uh, how do we do it? Uh, what, and then uh, uh, I like this title in French, uh, piège et opportunité. I mean, to, to traps and opportunities of, of uh, social innovative action research. I mean, don't deceive yourself. What are the limits uh, of the opportunities and what are the traps we absolutely would like to, to avoid? And then I said, I want to uh, especially say a few words on the emancip emancipatory power of social innovation action research. What is action research? As already suggested, there are so many explicit or implicit definitions of action research. Um, for us, the most uh, useful definitions are quite holistic in the sense that uh, uh, action research should start from a particular issue that is addressed not only by activists, by policymakers, by uh, social entrepreneurs, and so on, but also by researchers. And of course, the, the roles of research and action, they can be combined in, in the same person or in, in a very mixed group of person. But what is important here is that we, we look at the whole picture. We look at uh, the research and action initiatives in a holistic way. Holistic meaning uh, the belief that the parts of something are interconnected and can be explained only by reference to the whole. Um, if you, you read some of the, the godfathers on uh, joint learning, social learning, and, and so on, uh, uh, popular learning, you, you find out that they believe very much in making the connection between 
a macro analysis of the system in which the learning and the action takes place and the opportunities and constraints lived by the actors, by the agents in the local context. By doing this, the, the whole no longer remains abstract. It is revealed through experience, observation and analysis. The trigger of the cooperation between the different actors is a combination of urgency. I mean, we need to find uh, uh, new shelter for people losing uh, their homes because of floods, because of wars and, and so on. And, and the scientific insights on how you can provide shelter in, in the short and medium term. Uh, short food chain initiatives, for example, for many people, they are an immediate reaction to insecurity, food insecurity. For other people, it's a challenge to plan for the medium term for, towards uh, an alternative uh, food system. So what is social innovative action research? Um, I already said, I already referred to uh, this multitude of trajectories in, in the history of uh, action research. Uh, we, co we covered some of the work in, in the uh, International Handbook on Social Innovation, which was mentioned before. Uh, we ourselves, we were quite inspired by uh, Elish uh, uh, Freire. We were inspired by the, the work of Gibson Graham. We were inspired by uh, asset and skills based community development approaches. But we were also inspired, obviously, by our own thoughts and experiences, which, which uh, started to emerge and hybridize. Uh, in this uh, poverty tree program of the European Commission, in which we tried to really uh, transform the rather static, the rather administrative job of an evaluator into that, into the role of, of an active and, and committed uh, researcher uh, involved in an action research project. By the way, and very important for understanding our definition of action research is our definition of uh, social innovation. It's about the satisfaction of unsatisfied and badly satisfied human needs uh, by whatever actors. It's about rebuilding, solidifying social relations based on solidarity and cooperation. Mutual aid ideas of, of the anarchist movement uh, plays a role there. And it's about social political empowerment, of which you believe that it can only be built through the revisiting, through the rebuilding of social relations. We live in a very individualist society. Uh, there is still is a lot of solidarity, but still uh, we need to invest quite a bit in rebuilding cooperation, in rebuilding support relations. We also argue that the definition of social innovation uh, should combine these three dimensions. It's not enough to satisfy human needs uh, if you do not work towards, towards social political empowerment and transformation, for example. How did we do it in this uh, uh, informal social innovation action research networks? And I see that some of my old uh, colleagues and also young colleagues uh, are also attending this uh, Zoom meeting, who, uh, partnerships, alliances, how do they grow in, in such a, a more spontaneous social innovation action research network? We look at the issues. The Poverty Tree Program, there were a number of projects uh, which were very much focused on working in a very community development oriented way, multidimensional, looking at the social, the economic, the political, architectural, ecological aspects. So we had to bring in all these disciplines to be able to understand what was going on. We had to be open enough to listen to the very hard criticisms of the practitioners saying that, well, please, scientists, stop bullshitting, come to the point. What is your message? How can you help us? And so bit by bit, you manage to build a very synergetic dialogue. We worked, and you already understood it, from the beginning on local development projects. Later on, we diversified it. 
As I said before, the macro context for this kind of local development action uh, research project is extremely important. You have to understand uh, the, the social political system, you have to understand uh, the role of the real estate sector, which is an absolutely important factor if you want to do anything at all in, in local development in urban areas. So basically, you need to reconstruct the structure. And how did we do that? Um, how did we do that? Well, before I answer that question, I will show you two slides. One is the overview of the projects. You find all the details in the article I sent to the organizers and uh, yeah, whose purpose it can be to be shared with everybody. Uh, 25 years of uh, uh, social innovative research for local development. It's published in international planning studies. Um, no time to go in details here. But the next slide is quite interesting because it shows the trajectory. So if I want to answer the question, how did we do it? We moved from a very elementary role of theory, like a theory saying that you can, you can invest, you can build social cohesion by working on social capital, by working on emotional intelligence and so on going through a whole process that in the end leads you to what we call a meta theory. A meta theory is not a, an abstract concept. It is a narrative that has been built by researchers, activists, local, local politicians, uh, uh, civil servants together. This narrative brings in these macro elements I already referred to as well as it brings in the nitty gritties of the local actions, the initiatives. I mean, we have written and documented this in, in uh, hundreds of monographs, I, I, I am uh, allowed, allowed to say. So there is a changing role of theory from very narrow disciplinary approaches to a grand narrative, a meta theory where there is room for theoretical explanations coming from different disciplines on the one hand, and the narratives from the practitioners, how they observe, how they live, how, how they desire to change the situation that they are working on. This, the same development or a parallel development um, has been uh, going on in, in our methodological de development. We started from participatory observation in neighborhoods in the project for poverty tree. Uh, we started from participatory observation in neighborhoods and localities, developing strategies to surpass, surpass the consequences of industrial uh, restructuring through shared analysis, collective strategy definition, the role of the integrated area development, which was fancy at the time also in, in European discourse, but to which we give we gave uh, a very interdisciplinary content, not just economic, but also social, also uh, politically mobilizing and, and, and so on. So in the early stage in our action research trajectory, uh, we, as I said, we worked between, we worked uh, through cooperation between different uh, disciplines, but we very soon moved on from interdisciplinarity to transdisciplinarity in which actors and uh, scientists uh, could work together and could form synergies. I already explained the role of theory, the, the development from, let's say, very disciplinary oriented uh, theori theorization to the grand narrative, the meta theory. So the role of theory from the multidisciplinary composition of an integrated framework, like in the integrated area development mo model, to the co-production of a meta theory, a grand narrative of how local actors operate within a complex system of social, economic, political development. Um, a, a grand narrative, obviously, is about a world full of contradiction in which socially innovative strategies and processes built their way, but ran, in, ran into obstacles. 
uh, a consequence of this grand narrative could, for example, be that uh, the European Commission has to turn back part of its neoliberal policy approach. Uh, a lot of socially, socially innovative initiatives today, um, they bump into, into the problems of energy provision. They bump into the, pro into the problems of uh, uh, competition law and so on. And Europe has the power to turn back some of these too liberal uh, dynamics and create, if you like, some protected economic spaces to let people rediscover their own destiny and build uh, socially innovative initiatives uh, uh, all over the place that do not necessarily have to be checked uh, according to productivity, uh, uh, competitiveness uh, norms, and, and so on. OK. I already explained uh, this slide, so I, I can move on to the next one. So this collective process from project to project, projects you saw in the slide, and you will have the slides, uh, I understand, uh, from the organizers. From stage to stage in each project came with a wide and also evolving methodological diversity. Consortium building. Networking me me methods, which can go from uh, meeting people in a bar and say, oh, that's interesting. Can I visit your project? Can we collaborate? To more systematic mobilization process, to, to networking and snowballing processes. Um, action and research are quite often already symbiotic at this kind of uh, uh, consortium building things, because you want to discover the skills knowledge skills, practice skills, experience, and so on. Communication methods, ranging from collective observation to open discussions and debates on values, objectives, strategies, in which visualization, design, prototyping, but also interdisciplinary multi-party analysis have important roles. Doing this, we have a, a rather critical uh, attitude towards the role of impact assessment towards the role of indicators and so on. We agree if you also integrate experiences, narratives, feedback loops into your evaluation and assessment processes, that then you can find uh, a good and, and workable compromise between looking at quantitative indicators on the one hand and valorizing experiences and feedback mechanisms from people on the other hand. Very important, and that will uh, uh, help me to come to my uh, uh, point about uh, the emanci emancipatory power of uh, action, socially innovative action research. Very important are the modes of governance. Questions similar on how to build commons, for example, and how to govern came to, to the front. Uh, action research consortium cannot be hierarchical. It has to work according to norms of mutual respect, uh, uh, listening attitudes, uh, communication, uh, reflexivity, self-evaluation, and so on. So here we are very much influenced by pragmatist uh, uh, philosophy and thinking and, and practice and so on. Um, we have an ongoing project on which we are publishing right now. Uh, it's called Indigo. Some of you know about it. Uh, it's very much based on the, the methodology that we borrowed from the Théorie des Cités. We did a, a, a really big effort to uh, operationalize Théorie des Cités towards building of commons, towards building of socially innovative governance. Piège et opportunité, here I will just read uh, my, my uh, concerns and then I will move on to uh, my point on the em emancipatory power of action research. Opportunities here of uh, socially innovative action research is to close the gap between scientists, activists, well-meaning politicians and policymakers. Some of the most interesting discussions I had in my academic career were with the cleaning staff, with the technical staff, and so on. I'm not saying my colleagues were not interesting, but it was a different world we, we were sharing when we had these uh, technical, uh, nitty-gritty, very down-to-earth discussions. Develop shared languages. 
learn to cooperate, rehabilitate the role of theory and reflection. Yeah, these things go together. Shared languages. I, I remember uh, uh, when I worked uh, in Portugal and I saw Artur da Rosa Pires is, is also among the participants, um, to understand what was going on in neighborhoods where people uh, who were principally aged and uh, disabled, physically disabled lived. We had to go into the houses and we had to just set up a chat, a conversation uh, around coffee and cake to understand what were the deep needs and how th these people interacted with each other. This is a language. It's a language that doesn't come with a dictionary and that doesn't come with a grammar book, but it's a language. And it's a language that is very important in, in building uh, socially innovative networks of, co of corporations. Um, the next one I just mentioned, experiment with uh, new modes of bottom-up, bottom-link democracy that are relevant to, to political transformation. We did a lot of uh, experiments with this. And the literature is, is about bottom-link democracy. You can go to Google Scholar if you want to, to know more about this. Methodological hybridization uh, is obviously an opportunity which we should fully ex exploit in socially innovative action research. Uh, piège et opportunité, piège, vivre dans un monde et perdre le sens de big bad world outside. I think you all recognize this. Uh, we used to call it a localism trap. We have to be careful that what we live and build in our small world uh, is not uh, representative, not necessarily representative for places and uh, uh, contexts elsewhere. That does not mean they cannot be meaningful as a learning input for elsewhere. Facilitating caring ne neoliberalism in the form of che cheap welfare state uh, operated by NGOs and civil society organizations. There is a huge literature uh, blaming social innovation as being the lackey of neoliberalism. What neoliberalism cannot provide in terms of welfare uh, uh, should be provided by NGOs and then states are, are willing to finance NGOs to provide cheaper social services. This is absolutely to be, to be avoided. Uh, it's, it's very dangerous also for the future of democracy. And a couple more, you will read. Okay, I'm going to finish. Um, the emancipatory potential of social innovation action research. Well, in a context of uh, socially innovative action research, we learn to talk different languages again. We learn to analyze again. Uh, yesterday I was doing field work uh, together with one of my colleagues and, and a PhD student. We were visiting uh, uh, urban agriculture projects in, in Brussels. And then you, you immediately had this mix of analysis, analytical analysis, political analysis, very practical problems of how you provide the necessary inputs for composting in, in, this, in the setting in Brussels and, and so on. So these modes of communications, this mix of topics of communication are very important to, to, to learn collectively. It is an important element of human emancipation. We as individuals and as specialized groups too much have the tendency to promote and to put forward our own language. We should spend as much in attention to learning the languages of others and, and try to speak the languages of others and work towards a shared language. Social and political emancipation. So many socially innovative initiatives are acts of emancipatory behavior in which joint exploration, formulation of progress and equity agendas occupy key roles. Uh, emancipation movements involve learning and action in socially innovative action research sense. Uh, again, looking at urban gardening, uh, uh, short chain uh, agriculture, 
putting in place of alternative food systems. What you see there is a very, very interesting new forms, modes of cooperation between uh, local authorities, civil services, civil, civil servants, sorry, who often are very much fed up with uh, the political blah, 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 and want to do something concrete. And they adopt the language of the NGOs. They adopt the language of the people working in the field. They adopt the language of action researchers. And uh, in this way, in the round setting of uh, local governance, local governments rediscover the meaning of grassroots democracy and are building together with all of us what we like to call bottoming governance, uh, which is not bottom up. It's not the NGOs that should tell the politicians or, or functionaries what to do. No, it's about learning interactively very intelligent and motivated uh, local civil servants interacting with activists, with practitioners, building together new modes of communication, co-decision making, co-learning and so on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for this comprehensive overview of social innovation action research. Uh, the next speakers will complete your presentations with examples as coordinators of action research projects. So we now welcome Anna Seravili uh, from Sweden and Yuna Shifuro from France. So Anna, you are a Sweden researcher on sustainable transition and design for social innovation. You hold a PhD in design and social innovation and give lecture at the School of Art and Communication at Matmo University. You are also the coordinator of the Menmo University Design and Innovation for Sustainability Lab where you use the method of participatory design based on the works of the founder of the DESIS Labs, Ezio Manzini. So, Hannah, uh, what is the participatory design approach and how do you use it to develop and implement social innovation? Yes, the participatory design. Of, thank you very much for having me here today. It has been really inspiring morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to say, uh, and also thank you very much to uh, Frank for a really interesting presentation. And um, as you mentioned, Emeline, I'm, uh, I'm a researcher within the participatory design uh, tradition and particularly the Scandinavian participatory design, which has been emerging in the 70s, mainly to respond to a very practical uh, concern. ICT uh, and information technology uh, and um, information and uh, technology was entering the workplace. And it was very much filled as a threat uh, by workers and unions uh, as they were concerned about uh, technology uh, bringing away um, uh, jobs and the skilling workers. So at that time, some researchers started to work together with uh, workers and unions to create technology together. So not um, designing for uh, workers, but designing with workers. And this kind of approach has been both uh, being based on a, on a practical, uh, practical aspiration. So how can we involve the knowledge of, of users of their use situation in the creation of new solutions, but also political uh, stance. So very much as a question of, of democracy, how do we open up uh, the creation of new solutions so that citizens and different kinds of actors can participate. Um, and uh, moving forward uh, from the workplace, uh, very much in the last 20 years, uh, uh, the participatory design uh, community has been working, engaging more and more with societal questions and also uh, social innovation. Uh, here in Malmo, we have been working for uh, almost uh, uh, 10 years with what was called the uh, Malmo Living Labs, which were very much focusing on, uh, similarly to what have been called this morning, social innovation labs or community labs, in being out uh, in the city, working with different stakeholders to uh, support and uh, bottom up um, processes and, and, and social innovation. 
and very much trying to focus uh, on more marginal actors or, or silenced actors uh, and, and, uh, and try to give space to these voices that perhaps are often not very much considered. So a strong focus on civil society, um, but especially on, on those actors that perhaps are a bit also marginal uh, in, in, this, in this landscape. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting to notice that social innovation does not only apply to a service or a good, but can land within the process of designing themselves itself. Um, we will talk later in more details about your work uh, with the municipalities. Yuna, uh, you are a French researcher and teacher at the National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment in Rai. As an expert of sustainable agriculture, you participated to the European Sustainable Agriculture Dialogue, dialogue oh, sorry for my English, it's worse, <laughs> in defining EU's research and innovation post-2020 objectives. Your study focuses on short food supply chains as a solution to diversify small entrepreneurs' revenues and provide healthier food for consumers. In this way, you believe short food supply chains to be a social innovation as a way to reappropriate food and empower producers, sellers, and consumers. So can you tell us more uh, about your uh, action and how upscaling and improving your innovation? Thank you. Uh, good morning to everyone. So thank you for the, this introduction, this invitation, and thank you, Frank, to, to mention my work in your slide. Um, so uh, let me share the, the, the first example of uh, social innovation. It's a French research and development network uh, dedicated to short food supply chain. So we create, we co-created uh, this uh, network with, uh, with researchers from different disciplines and stakeholders in 2015 to produce uh, collective expertise and tools uh, to facilitate the development of a sustainable food chain, the short food chain. Uh, it is funded by the Ministry of Agriculture and Food in France and works as a living lab, producing a knowledge and tools in which a large diversity of actors uh, meet regularly in working group, but not only to find solutions uh, regarding problems not taken in account by uh, uh, public policies or markets. They also uh, make uh, evolve norms and regulations concerning food systems. Uh, which still mainly support unsus unsustainable food systems. Uh, that refers to the transformative and not only compensatory uh, dimension of social innovation. And this knowledge and tools, including a, a new indicator of uh, performance as trust, uh, biodiversity preservation or democracy um, uh, are diffused in the network and more largely uh, via the webinars, documents uh, available for all and for free, of course. Uh, just let me share a second uh, example. So I also co-created uh, in 2014 uh, with elected uh, officials from um, uh, a small city uh, near Montpellier in south of France, but also with citizens and professionals, um, a trademark called ICC Local. It's a free public and participatory uh, labeling systems. Uh, for products uh, to, to, to help people to identify them in a, uh, not only in a short chain, but also in retail. Um, so uh, it's now used in more than uh, 20 French uh, small to medium cities, and we are discussing uh, about the implementation of this social innovation in, uh, in bigger cities like uh, Lyon in France. And from a research perspective, just last point, uh, we use these uh, networks uh, developed around these uh, social innovations as part participatory and living observatories um, of their impact uh, on agricultural practices and food behaviors because the transition of food system is uh, an urgency. Uh, but also uh, we look at how these social innovation make evolve national and local policies. Great, great. So you, you both work on fostering social innovation uh, based on stakeholders' involvement. So you, you gather researchers, local communities, NGOs, enterprises, public sector. Uh, but how does it work? Uh, how does this diversity of actors help co-create and implement social innovation? And what are the challenges? Uh, maybe, Anna, you can start? Yes, uh, thank you. I think it's uh, it's starting out from a design perspective the focus is very much on trying to create shared experiences 
So trying to drive concrete initiatives like projects, and in this way, using this concrete sharing is initiative as some kind of platform for developing what Frank discussed, presented as this shared language. Uh, because bringing these actors together, I think the biggest challenge is both they are bringing not only different roles, but also different logics and way to see things and, and, and roles. So very much I think the challenge is how do you align uh, and create possibilities for dif these different ways of understanding and operating to meet um, and to also create opportunities to to challenge, uh, for example, certain things which are taken for granted, because it's not just a meeting between different actors, it's also a meeting between power, different power positions. Uh, so in our case, for example, we have been focusing a lot in the last year on how can we open up uh, the municipality and perhaps challenge some of the uh, ways of working there and ways of thinking, so to make more space for, for uh, uh, smaller actors and, and different ways of, of working. Okay, okay. And Yuna, how do you do? <laughs> yes, uh, so um, in, uh, in the case of the trademark, so the trademark is really um, um, above all a process and not a, a marketing trademark. So this, uh, this process is managed by a, a multi-stakeholder committee, including producers, consumers, uh, citizen sellers and local authorities with a facilitators that can be uh, a chamber of agriculture or a consumer association and the committee decide together collectively uh, the criteria to be respected for a local and uh, sustainable product and, uh, and uh, ensure the, the, the well uh, functioning of the system. Then the committee co-create its own declination of the trademark and um, um, I in this process, so I, as a researcher, I train the facilitators. Um, I facilitate exchanges between the local committees so that they can help each other collectively improve uh, the trademark, but also uh, this network address uh, so, so this network of committees uh, in France. So it also addresses uh, societal issues and is a second level of social innovation. So we have a multi-level uh, um, uh, social innovation um, in, in, with many relations with, you know, between them and uh, embedded in local uh, areas, but also uh, having impact on the, on the national level. Sorry, my mic is off. Um, so thank you very much. Um, can you tell me, tell us more about the, the outcomes of your work? And if you want to give us more details, please, you're welcome. And uh, I'll show you your key learnings and recommendations for people that wanted to do the same thing as you. Anna? Yes, I think uh, the, it's, it's, uh, I think the, uh, the important outcomes in our case has been trying the small, the changes we have been able to do within the municipality structures and, and procedures. Because in these processes, as, as Frank mentioned, it's, it's often a meeting between people that is very willing and, and understands the need of, of, uh, of uh, working in a different way, of creating these alliances. But often, and this is we experience a lot with civil servants who are coming back to their own organization, they lack the capacity to integrate back these sort of new ways of working and thinking. So very much, the, I think the results, the best, the, the most important results we have been achieving is when we have managed to create some changes in, in, the, in the structure. And this is really, it's really, really hard, uh, hard work, I would say. And recommendations for people who would like to do the same kind of work is really much about uh, uh, being very humble in the meeting of, of, of different actors and try really to understand uh, these different logics and perhaps also question where do you come from uh, and what kind of also assumptions are you bringing in uh, as, a, as a researcher or, or another actor, because this is a, a very difficult often to, to perceive and to be seen. Thank, thank you. Nina? Um, in all cases, so uh, local food systems, short food chains, so uh, have long been uh, marginalized uh, because institutions uh, dominating the uh, agricultural sectors 
uh, seeing them as systems of the past, opposed to progress, opposed to technology. So um, that's why uh, during a long time, the, and even now, the, there are few resources to develop them. So, but however, if, uh, if social innovation only reaches those, those already convinced, it has no transformative dimension. So um, it is precisely because we co-create new knowledge with stakeholders, with citizens, uh, new data, um, because we, we did not have data before, and uh, it was just uh, uh, an image or, um, of such a supply chain. We, we did not know before what, what precisely they do and they, um, they provoke. So it's through this co-creation of knowledge that we have been able to, to show that these systems are, are part of the solutions. Uh, for now, for the future, and uh, to involve actors who were initially reluctant. So that's why uh, it was also, and um, in this process, we also have to convince uh, researchers in art science, because also they, they think that it's only a joke and not uh, really uh, a driver of social change. So that's why uh, my recommendation is really to, to, um, uh, to, to have a robust and participatory action research to co-create data, but new data with new indicator of performance important for people uh, to, um, to collectively uh, assess and uh, through practice also um, assess these uh, new movements and uh, to also to uh, uh, make people um, more aware about uh, the potential of these uh, social innovations. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to bring your perspectives on this topic. Um, are there questions for the speakers or maybe reactions? Maybe, Frank, do you want to react to what Anna and Yuna said? Have you said? No. Les gens ont faim. I was muted, so. OK. Um, I want to react to this point that Veronique was making. Is that possible? Experimentations are mainly set up on a three-year basis. Uh, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, when you talk uh, and you, you work with NGOs, for example, they complain about uh, the... Uh, the fact that they always have to rewrite proposals, that they have to uh, uh, resubmit proposals, that their funding is so uh, uh, fragile in, in a way. And at the level of the citizens and, and the participants in, in projects, uh, you experience a, a similar uh, uh, reaction, which is, yeah, it's nice. We can do this for two, three years, but what afterwards? So, um, not consciously, but unconsciously, I, I started to co collaborate more with projects that have a, a longer horizon that reach further in, into the future, which means that you have to make some compromises. You have to make some compromises with, with funders. You have to make some uh, uh, compromises with the uh, local authorities and, and so on. But uh, there is a lot of potential. I mean, I, I was referring to uh, uh, short food chain initiatives in Brussels, uh, uh, which we visited yesterday. You see that uh, this kind of cooperation is possible. What you need uh, uh, is a kind of implicit or explicit agreements with, with local authorities. Uh, you also have to be uh, uh, concerned about building connections between the different uh, levels of governance. I mean, the, these levels of governments, they are not just uh, em embodied by rules, regulations, procedures. No, they are embodied by active people who really do their job and take their job seriously. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, yeah, disappointing citizens is, is a big risk, is a big risk as I uh, flagged up uh, in, in my piège, as I think. Anna, you want to speak again? Yes, and I, I think it's a really good question. And I think it's also pointing at uh, that perhaps what, what kind of assumptions do we, are we using when we approach social innovation? And I'm thinking this question of funding, it's really, really like key. And is it three years 
uh, um, um, how do you say, a, a, a time frame that is reasonable when it comes to working with, with societal impact and, and changing and trying to actually change, uh, bring about social change. Uh, so, and I'm thinking, where does this three year uh, fr framing comes from? Uh, and it's perhaps more rooted in, in, in more technological uh, kind of innovation. So in that sense, um, I think it's really, really important to, to think about also uh, this kind of assumptions uh, in relation how funding works and how can we open up also these kind of questions uh, in, when working with social innovation and thinking a little about what is that uh, what, what is that institutions are different levels are somehow uh, reproducing and taking, for example, from traditional innovation that is not really, that doesn't really fit uh, the goals of, of, of social innovation. Okay. Thank you. Um, Can I say something very briefly? Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, discussing with the gardeners in, in these Brussels projects, they said, well, why can the high tech sector get billions of support a year? And why do we have to justify with our very socially relevant projects? Why do we have to justify our 10, 20, or even 100,000 uh, uh, euro subsidies? I mean, uh, I will leave that with you, but it's a very important question. It could be a conclusion as well. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you, thank you so much to, to all of you. Um, so now we I will make my closing remarks uh, for this conference. Um, so I will conclude with a few learnings from this conference and the preparatory interviews with the speakers. Um, what we see is that we need to insist on the diversity of social innovation. Uh, social innovation can be seen as a needed component for companies' business models in the future, but as well as coming from citizen-led initiatives. We see there are two main trends around about social innovation. But there is a consensus on the need of co-production, co collaboration. Uh, you all agree on the fact that social innovation should be developed in a participatory way and involve all the key stakeholders, especially the users and the beneficiaries of the social innovations. And it raises governance issues on dealing with uh, social innovation. And you also agreed on the need of to assess the impact of social innovation, but because it implies having new kind of data and making, uh, we hope, better decisions um, you, you can differ on the approaches on how to measure this impact um, and what you expect from the European Union on this, because there is still a challenge uh, about standardization. Is it possible? Is it feasible? Um, is it wishable? Uh, so this is a, an open question. Um, as social innovation should be participatory, uh, the social impact assessment process also should be collaborative. And we can use quantitative data, um, measurement with uh, indicators, but uh, it must be completed with discussions with people. It's really important to discuss, to keep um, the, uh, an open discussion uh, with stakeholders and local people. Um, yeah, so thank you to all of you. Um, and we we'll make our best at the impact tank uh, to contribute to these passionate topics. And I wish you bon appétit. Bon appétit à tous. Uh, il est midi, c'est parfait, on a fini à temps. So thank you to all of you. Uh, so there will be a replay of the conference and the slides will be available. So do not worry, if you miss something, you can see again uh, the webinar or the conference or and send the link to, uh, to people around you that could be interested in what we said this morning. So thank you to all of you. And there will be a synthesis of all the said things you said uh, and a short paper um, will be communicated on our website and our social networks. You will have access to the video of the minister, Amélie de Montchalin, and to the biography that uh, we talked about during this conference. So thank you to all of you. And, uh, once again, bon appétit, bon weekend, et à bientôt, on espère. Au revoir. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Au revoir. Arrivederci.
Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. <lacht>